Man, every time I see that video, I think I'm ready to take a hike. You with me? Let's go. <laughs> Shout out to our video team, always doing a great job. Man, good morning, Northridge Church. If you haven't met me, uh, my name is Connell. Would love to get the chance to meet you. Uh, you'll find me normally hanging out with our 6th through 12th graders uh, during the week. Our student ministry, I just had one wave at me. What's up, brother? Uh, hey, wherever you are, I do want to say a special shout out to our students, whether you're here in the room, tuning in online, or you're out in Webster. I love you guys. Can't wait to be with you. Parents, this is your last week uh, to register your student for our weekend summer camp at the end of this month. Uh, Saranac Lake is a blast. And uh, we can't wait uh, to be with your student, so get them registered. Man, this morning, I, uh, I came to tell you one thing. I don't get angry. I don't get angry. I have family and friends that say, Connell, I have never seen you angry. You don't get angry. And I simply tell them it's because I don't get angry. I'm kidding. What I should say is that it's because you've never been in a car with me. <laughs> I have this deep, simmering road rage within my heart. I can remember uh, a time about five years ago, I was 19, I was playing a scrimmage game at Roberts Wesleyan College on a, on a Sunday night, and I lived in West Henrietta at the time, and to get to Roberts Wesleyan College, you had to take some back roads. And there was this uh, stretch of road in the wheatland Chilai area that ran from 35 to 55. And we get on this road, I should say I get on this road and I get behind this truck. And he's going 25 in a 35. My parents used to call this, he was out for a nice Sunday afternoon stroll. Have you heard that before? Well, I was not out for a Sunday afternoon stroll. I had somewhere to be, and so I'm riding this guy's tail. Mom, I, this is the first time you may have ever heard this. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm a sinner. I'm riding this guy's tail. I got somewhere to be, trying to get somewhere. We get to this stop sign. We stop. He cuts me off, and he gets out of his car, and he walks over to my window. I roll my window down, and he starts saying some things I can't say at church, if you know what I mean. Well, we had our nice little conversation, and he went on the way, we went on the way, for our nice Sunday afternoon drive. I wish I could stand up in front of you and say, I'm the only one that has road rage. But I don't. Let me ask you a quick question. When it comes to my story, whose side are you on? I hope mine. <laughs> But let me give you some quick statistics when it comes to road rage in America. 82% of people admitted to committing an act of road rage in the past year. A total of 12,610 injuries and 218 murders have been attributed to road rage over a seven year period in the United States. 30 murders annually are linked to road rage and there's been over a 500% increase and reported cases of road rage over the last 10 years. Friends, it looks like we have a cultural problem. And I haven't even brought up social media yet. We have an anger issue. Let me maybe make this a little bit more for spe specific for you this morning. Are you angry this morning? What did you walk into one of our campuses or tuning in online, what are you feeling this morning? What is boiling up inside of you? Over the last couple of weeks, we've been driving through Matthew chapter five, Jesus' sermon on the mount. And today, we're gonna be engaging with anger. And before we jump into anger, I want you to know that Jesus has something for you today. Maybe more specifically, Jesus has something for your anger today. And I think it's important that we all step back, and, and I wonder if Jesus is waiting for us to step back and start to look at the stories that, we, that we've written when it comes to our anger, when it comes to others' anger, and when it comes to the world's anger. Jesus speaks in Matthew 5, 21 
and 22. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in, the, in danger of the fire of hell. Before we talk about anger this morning, I want to clarify something. Jesus isn't changing Old Testament law here. But rather, Jesus is, is really clarifying muddy water. He's saying, you have heard that it was said, but now I tell you this. Jesus is saying, this is what you're to be obedient toward. This is what you are to follow. Jesus is comparing anger to murder here. This is crazy. Not just in this culture, but in our culture. If I told you, yeah, that story I told you earlier, that, that would be comparable to murder. You'd be like, Connell, you're crazy. There, there, there's no way. This is what Jesus is doing. So why, why does Jesus say this? Jesus is getting to the personal heart of the matter. More specifically, Jesus is saying that all bad anger shares the same DNA, the sinful heart. In our time together this morning, we're not going to be talking about good, righteous anger. We're just going to be talking about bad anger. Some examples of good, righteous anger uh, when confronting sin are, are, are examples like this. Child abuse, uh, pornography, racism, abortion. These are things that we can get righteously angry against. We're not talking about that this morning. If you tune into our podcast this week, we'll talk a little bit about good anger, bad anger, and anger in general. This morning, we're encountering bad anger. In all bad anger, it takes root in the sinful heart. Jesus is saying anyone who is angry with a person is in danger. He says anyone who says raka, which means worthless or, or empty or you fool, is in danger of hell. Theologian D.A. Carson would say it like this, all such vilifying anger lies at the root of murder and makes a thoughtful man conscious that he differs not wit, morally speaking, from the actual murder. What is Jesus saying? What is D.A. Carson coming alongside this text and saying? Well, he's saying that an improper attitude or to be unrighteously angry with another person makes one subject to God's judgment. Who can honestly claim that they've never been angry towards someone else or that every unhappy thought was perfectly justified? In this case, no man, no woman is not guilty. All are guilty. Jesus is saying that the argument you had on the way to church this morning is the same as murder. He's saying that the argument you had with your spouse earlier this week is the same as murder. He's saying the anger that you took out on your significant other is the same as murder. Bad anger, the same as murder. And we all experience anger, friends. We all do. Some of us explode, some of us simmer, some of us uh, keep it deep, deep down. Some of us explode at loved ones. Some of us talk behind their back. Some of us just keep it within us until we finally, finally get the chance to prove that we're right. If I'm honest, I'm quick to anger. And it's not when sin and injustice happen. No, it's when Connell's life, Connell's feelings, Connell's people are at stake not at things that I should be angry over. Bad anger at its core, it says, I'm against that. Again, not when sin and injustice happen, but when our lives are affected. Counselor David Paulison would say, when anger goes bad, it's because, motive, it's because motives operate in God-like mode. You see, anger is personal. Anger is personal. 
I want my way, I demand my way, and if I don't get my way, I am the victim. I'll be honest, my ego gets caught up in this emotion. Does yours? Mine does. Jesus is addressing the deepest part of our anger, our sinful heart. And if the problem of bad anger is as deep as our heart, so must the solution be. So if the root problem of bad anger is our sinful heart, the solution must go as deep as the sinful heart. That's important. Jesus removes any ego. He strips the initial conversation from murder and he gets to the heart of it, anger. And as I stated earlier, none of us have a pathway out. None of us get out of this because we're all guilty. Anger is personal because it's rooted in our heart. Jesus continues in verse 23. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison." Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. If the first part of our time together this morning is is Jesus saying that anger is personal, uh, what is Jesus telling us here? Well, anger isn't just personal, it affects all of us. It affects our relationships. And so anger isn't just personal, it's interpersonal. Jesus has called us to consider and to care for others. In fact, Jesus cares deeply that you care for others. He cares so deeply that he says, hold on, stop, stop. Leave your gifts at the altar. Leave them here. Leave them at church. It'll be here when when you get back. And go. Make amends. Care for that person. If your anger has affected someone in such a way, go. Care for them. Make amends. Jesus cares that you care for others. Some of us need to go. We need to make amends with that family member. We need to make amends with that friend, with that someone. Jesus doesn't just tell us to deal with our anger personally, but he tells us to consider and act on how our anger has affected others. Jesus says, own your part. I haven't always been good at this. I don't stand in front of you today and act like I'm perfect in this. I got a lot of ways to go. I'm working on it. We all need to work on this. But some of us need to go, consider, act, and make amends when it comes to our relationships with people. Paul in the book of Ephesians would say it like this, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Every effort to keep unity through the bond of the peace of God, that is beautiful and we have to consider that more. In your relationships, have you made every effort? Have you? And the only way we can do this is by the spirit of the living God. That's how we make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And here's what I know this morning. Anger comes with a lot of baggage. It comes with a lot of weight. You see, anger doesn't just handle today's conversations. It doesn't just handle today's events. But when anger comes up, it carries a lot of baggage, a lot of mixed emotions, not just current events, but historical events, uh, historical people, historical conversation. A lot of baggage comes with it. It's heavy. Maybe more specifically uh, for you this morning, and and please, individual, listen to me. I'm sorry if you have been someone 
that has been a victim of abuse. You've been raised in a family and all you know is anger. All you know is anger. Maybe you're in a, a marriage relationship right now and all that, that is in this relationship, it's, it's consumed by that anger. Maybe some of you, you walked into one of our auditoriums this morning or you're tuning in online and your life has been totally wrecked, totally ruined by anger. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But here's what I want each of you to know. God is merciful. God is merciful. He, he knows your blind spots. He knows your failures. He works patiently and persistently. He's merciful and he willingly meets you in the mess. That when anger's blind spots pop up, he knows them. When the truce of anger pops up, he knows them. He's merciful and he willingly meets you where you are in the mess. Whether you're the angry one, whether someone else is the angry one, whether it's the world that's, that's bringing the anger, he is merciful. He willingly meets us. But Connell, you don't understand. You don't understand how anger has affected my life, how bad anger has controlled my home, how it's controlled my relationships, how it's controlled my life. You don't get it. You see, we need help. We need forgiveness we need a savior. We need godly wisdom to change. And the good news is, Northridge Church, is we do. We do have a savior that only acted in good, righteous anger. And what a joy it is to look upon him. To look upon him as our example. And when he hung on a cross as he paid for the sins of you and I, look at the picture that Peter paints us. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. As he hung on a cross, as people made bets in front of him and spat upon him and cursed at his name, he trusted. He trusted in his father's will. He trusted in his father's plan. And he trusted in his father's justice for him. Maybe you feel defeated. And you feel like only Jesus could respond in such a way. Well, for you, I have more good news. Brad mentioned this verse last week, Philippians 1, 6, writes, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, my anger, your anger, it's messy, but we have to trust that God will continuously work in us, that he'll continue to mold us. And what's so beautiful about these words that Paul penned to the church of Philippi? It's when he wrote these words, he wasn't trusting in the people of the church, but he was trusting in the Savior over the church. And that same Savior over the church of Philippi is the same Savior over Northridge Church this morning. And we can trust him to continue to mold us, to continue to sanctify us. And so this morning, what are we to do? What are we to do with all of this bad anger? Well, we must pray and we must act in confidence that Jesus will finish the good work that he started in our hearts. And friends, that includes sanctifying our bad anger. It includes that. I love that we can look at scripture, we can look at Philippians 1, 6, and again, the same God who is over the church of Philippi is over us now. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you walked in the room, what you tuned in online with, out in Webster. Probably a lot of different angles to this morning followers of Jesus who just want to know more about him, skeptics who just cannot grasp, like, is this Jesus thing really real? 
just waiting for a, a way out, but man, there's just something, there's just something with this Jesus. Maybe you're angry. You're so, so angry. And, and somehow you, you, you're engaging with a Northridge service this morning. You know, a lot of times I look at scripture and I picture Jesus teaching and preaching uh, standing up. I, I envision him teaching to the multitudes from a standing position, but actually Jesus used to sit probably in a really cool stool like this one. <laughs> Maybe he even made it himself. Um, outside of outside of sitting on a stool, I, I don't necessarily know why Jesus did this. I know it was a common practice uh, for rabbis back in the day that they would teach from a seated position. But for Jesus, I think it was more than that. I think Jesus wanted to look people in the eyes. I think Jesus deeply cared for people in such a way that just, man, he wanted to look at them and draw them close. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been in uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where he's talking with his disciples. He's teaching his disciples. But many of times, Jesus would talk to multitudes of people. And there were the disciples, there were the followers who wanted to know more about their king, King Jesus. Oh, they wanted to know more about the ways and the wonder of this man. They wanted to be obedient to Jesus. They wanted to look more like Jesus. And so they came and they listened to Jesus speak and teach. And then there were the skeptics. There were the people who, man, they continued to come. They were waiting for Jesus to say something wrong. But oh, how this man, oh, how he was different. Oh, how he was different from anyone they've ever heard. And as he spoke, their hearts began to soften. And then there were many people who came that were angry. It didn't matter what Jesus would say. They were going to be angry. He was wrong. But again, oh, oh, how this man, oh, how he was different. His teachings, they were different. His posture, it was uh, different. His truths, they were different. This rabbi, this teacher, there's so much more. He has so much more. What is different about this king? What is different about this rabbi? What is different about this teacher? Well, I think David pens some beautiful words in Psalm 86, 15 that I think um, people saw when he spoke. But you, Lord, are compassionate and a gracious God. You're slow to anger, abounding in love and in faithfulness. So wherever you are this morning, if you're the follower of Jesus, if you came into uh, Northridge, if you're tuning online and you just, you came to learn more about the wonders uh, and, and ways of Jesus, how you can be more obedient to him, well, hear me, for you, he's slow to anger. He's gracious, he's compassionate, he's abounding in love and in faithfulness. And for you, the skeptic, you're waiting for, for the path to just turn. You're waiting for something to be said that's wrong. But oh, there's something about this man. For you, skeptic, he's slow to anger. He's gracious, he's compassionate. He's abounding in love and in faithfulness. And for you, the angry one, You've engaged in one of our services and you don't even know why you've tuned in. Nothing, nothing could change your mind, but oh, how this man is different. For you, he's slow to anger. He's slow to anger. He's gracious. He's compassionate. He's abounding in love and in faithfulness. I regularly reflect on Psalm 103. When it comes to our emotions, when it comes to things like anger, a specifically bad anger, again, there's a lot of baggage, a lot of weight that comes with this emotion. What does it mean for us today? 
What does it mean when we have no more hope? Well, not only do we have a hope in a savior, but Psalm 103, verse five specifically, talks about that in him, he doesn't just uh, restore good things, but in him is every good desire. And he will make you soar like the wings of an eagle. Why? Because this savior, this king is different. He's different. And if you guys, when you walk out of one of our services tonight, when you turn off the TV at home, if you could leave with one thing, I would want you to know that this man is different. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, the man who paid the penalty for you and for me, who lived a sinless life, who died the death that we deserve, and he defeated death and in the grave three days later, he is different. And for you, wherever you find yourself in the journey with anger, he's slow to anger. He's gracious, he's compassionate. He's abounding in love and in faithfulness. And he's that for each of us this morning. Wherever you are in your journey with anger, we have a savior that meets us in the mess. He's everything we need. Would you stand with me? I would love if we would posture our hearts. For me, I'm just gonna put my hand over my heart, whatever you're comfortable with, but I'd like to pray with you. Jesus, you are all that we need. We've walked in with a lot of baggage. We've walked in, I'm sure, with a lot of pain. We've wrestled with different emotions. We've come to the end of ourselves, but Father, we also recognize that you are good, that you're slow to anger, that you're gracious, that you're compassionate, that you're merciful, that you're abounding in love and in faithfulness. And as we posture our hearts to sing another song and talk about how awesome of a God you are, whatever wounds that are in the room, whatever wounds that are online, whatever wounds that are in Webster, God, I pray that you would move in a way that only you can move and that you would heal in the way that only you can heal. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you're different. Thank you that you're good. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.